This is the Global News Podcast from the BBC World Service. I'm Joe Lynham, and in the early hours of Friday the 16th of August, these are the main stories. U.S. Democrats have condemned a decision by Israel to block a planned visit by two congresswomen who've been critical of its treatment of Palestinians. And Gibraltar has ordered the immediate release of an Iranian supertanker seized six weeks ago by British Marines and local police. Also in this podcast... California renamed part of the Freeway 134 after President Obama. But could the address of the Trump Tower in New York change from 725 Fifth Avenue to 725 President Barack H. Obama Avenue? Israel has barred the entry of two U.S. Democratic Party congresswomen who've been critical of the country's policies towards the Palestinians. Rashida Tlaib and Ilan Omar have been expected to begin a tour of the Palestinian territories soon. But President Trump had urged Israel to prevent the visit, saying the congresswomen hated Israel and all Jewish people. Israeli officials say that they've been denied entry on account of their support for the international movement that urges a boycott of Israel. Palestinians have described the decision as an assault on their right to engage with the rest of the world. Julian Marshall got a reaction from Hanan Ashrawi, who would have been hosting the two congresswomen in the Palestinian territories. I think this is absolutely preposterous and unacceptable. I mean, they are denying entry to representatives of another country. I mean, their ally, the U.S., these are congresswomen who are coming to Palestine, not to Israel. They are coming to reach out to the Palestinian people to see how things are on the ground and the reality of the occupation. And now Israel gives itself the right to bar them from coming to Palestine, to ban them from entering, and at the same time to impose a blackout on Palestinian realities in order for them not to find out the truth. This is not acceptable, and I believe that this is an affront to the American people and to the representatives themselves. But unfortunately, Donald Trump himself, the president, was inciting against them and he was telling the Israelis not to uh, allow them in. But Israel would argue that it has a 2017 law that bars foreigners from entering the country who support a boycott of Israel. And uh, they would argue that that is what (laughs) these two congresswomen have been doing. Well, the thing is, Israel cannot tolerate dissent or differences of opinion. There are many people who who adopt this. There are many people who think that Israel should be held accountable. This is something that is universally acceptable. So Israel cannot legislate in order to violate international law and human rights. And Israel now thinks that not only is it above the law and it can do whatever it wants with the occupation, it wants to enjoy full impunity and it wants to punish those who want to hold Israel accountable and act in accordance with their conscience. Is this another reason for the Palestinians not to engage with the Trump administration? (laughs) I don't think we need another reason. I think that the Trump administration has taken illegal unilateral measures on the issues of Jerusalem, on the issues of refugees, on the issues of funding the Palestinians, on the issue of punishing the most vulnerable segments of our population. And of course, by refusing the two-state solution, the 67 borders, the, by refusing to acknowledge the fact of the occupation itself. So they have effectively violated every aspect of international law pertaining to the Palestinian question. So in a sense, I mean, there's nothing left to do other than incite against their own nationals, against the representatives of the American people. An American president is telling a foreign country not to admit members of his own Congress. (laughs) I mean, this lacks any sense of logic or political responsibility or respect for his own people even. Certainly, we said the moment that they decide to treat us as equals and to respect international law, then, of course, we are willing to talk to them. But since they are violating the law and violating our rights, there is no reason to engage. Senior Palestinian official Hanan Ashwari there. Julian Marshall also spoke to Yaakov Katz, editor-in-chief of the Jerusalem Post, who's currently in the United States. He asked him if he thinks Israel had done the right thing as regards the U.S. congresswomen. The short answer is no, in my personal opinion. I think that Israel by barring them, even though there is legislation in place that allows Israel to prevent people who are supportive of the BDS movement from entering the country, 
I don't think that it should have been applied in this case. These are elected officials from the United States. And, and what we have to remember, as bad as they might be, Rashida Tlaib and Ilhan Omar, and, and even anti-Semitic, they come from the Democratic Party. And Israel, for decades, since its inception pretty much, has always strived to ensure that it receives bipartisan support from both sides of the aisle in the U.S. Congress, Republican and Democrat. And what's happening now is Israel is becoming a political football. Israel is now barring them from entering the country, is aligning itself with the Republican Party. And whether Trump wins or doesn't win come 2020, the pendulum will one day swing back and it will hit Israel really, really hard. And this, this, this will not do well for the long-term support that Israel has enjoyed until now here in the United States. So you would argue that um, Israel has done the wrong thing because it risks alienating the U.S. Democratic Party. I completely think so. I think, you know, there will be people who will tell you that the Democratic Party is lost and anyhow it's moving away from Israel. And that might be the case and it might be something that Israel can no longer do or can no longer repair or change. But I don't think that we're yet at that no, the point of no return. I think that by doing this, Israel is uh, definitely going to be expediting that process. And that will not be good for the long-term U.S.-Israel alliance to ensure that that continues to thrive. That's number one. Number two is on a different level, it makes it seem like Israel has something to hide. And as an Israeli journalist and someone who's lived in Israel for, for 26 years now, I don't think we have anything to hide. On the contrary, I think anyone from our greatest detractors to our biggest supporters, Israel is a country that should let anyone come in who wants to come in. They should see Israel. They should see what the country really is like, how diverse it is, how interesting it is, how colorful it is, how there's a wide range of opinions on all matters from the Palestinian conflict. Why would the country want to hide that from people? And, and then on a third level, I'll just say that by not letting these Congress women into Israel, you've basically now catapulted them into a level of prominence that they just do not deserve. And uh, what was the worst that would have happened? They would have come, they would have made some comments, they would have tweeted some tweets, posted something on Facebook, been critical of Israel, the so-called occupation, etc. But now the damage will be so much greater. And, and, that, and Israel just shot itself in the foot, sadly. Yaakov Katzer, the editor-in-chief of the Jerusalem Post, the authorities in Gibraltar have ordered the immediate release of an Iranian oil tanker that was impounded last month by British armed forces and local police. The ship, the Grace One, was suspected of carrying Iranian oil to Syria in breach of European Union sanctions. It was freed on Thursday after Iran provided written assurances that the vessel wouldn't go to Syria. A lawyer, Charles Gomez, was in court on an unrelated matter when the ruling relating to the tanker was read out. The Chief Justice was shown documents to the effect that the Chief Minister had given notice that the ship is no longer a specified ship within the provisions of the uh, EU sanctions. And as it is no longer such a, a specified ship, there is no cause for its arrest, and therefore the arrest has lapsed immediately. There's no indication, though, of when the tanker will set sail. The BBC's Kazra Naji is in Gibraltar. Well, the court decided that on the request from the authorities from Gibraltar, it would uh, release this ship, Grace One, super tanker, Iranian tanker, uh, with its cargo of 2.1 million barrels of oil and 28 crew members. They were released there and then once the court decided. So the ship is going to set sail. The authorities in Gibraltar decided to recommend the releasing of the ship after they say they received assurances from the Iranian authorities that the ship is not going to sail to any country that is under EU sanctions. We know that uh, the reason why it was held up and impounded here was that it was under suspicion that it was carrying the oil to Syria. Now, the Americans tried to get involved. Uh, why did they want to prevent the tanker sailing on? Well, at 1.30 this morning, apparently, uh, uh, seven hours or so before the Supreme Court was going to sit and discuss the releasing of this ship, at 1.30 in the morning, uh, Department of Justice in the U.S. 
sent an email to the authorities in Gibraltar saying that they would like to seize the ship because of a number of allegations against the ship. We don't know what those allegations are. They haven't been made public. Uh, but uh, that um, uh, request uh, caused a lot of confusion here. The court had to adjourn and then reconvene again. But at the end, they decided that since there is no formal request to the court, the court will not discuss that and will not attend to that matter. Kazranaji. The dispute over tankers forms part of a wider power struggle in the Middle East and at its heart is oil and Iran's battle with Saudi Arabia for regional supremacy. I asked our diplomatic correspondent Jonathan Marcus about the power dynamics in the Gulf. Well, of course, in a purely bilateral sense between Britain, Gibraltar and the Iranians on the other hand, uh, this was essentially about Syria sanctions. That's the uh, story that we've been told. Uh, And yes, indeed, it was about Syria sanctions, if you believe that this is where the vessel was heading. Uh, And now, as far as that goes, it appears to have been resolved because the Grace One is free to go and it is not going to be heading to Syria. But of course, part and parcel of all this was the much broader struggle between the United States backing Saudi Arabia and others on the one hand and Iran. Now, it's a battle over regional uh, influence in the Gulf and the wider Middle East. It's a struggle where the Trump administration has decided to throw over the nuclear deal, which even many of his uh, Western allies still believe is the best way of of containing Iran's nuclear program. Mr. Trump has thrown over that deal. He's applying what the Americans call maximum pressure on Iran's economy, uh, fundamentally trying to bring the Iranian economy to its knees. Uh, When you then say to the Americans, well, what you're trying to do is change the regime in Tehran, Uh, They insist that they're not. But I think any sensible person looking at the trajectory of American policy at the moment would say that by hook or by crook, it is a policy of applying extraordinary pressure in an attempt to change, if not the policy, then fundamentally the regime in Tehran. Very briefly, to go back to this particular dispute over oil tankers, can we now assume that the British flagged ship Stena Impero will be released by the Iranians? Well, we very much hope that uh, a resolution to the detention of the Stena Impero and, of course, its crew uh, is closer. The British government has insisted all along that the two uh, uh, elements, the detention of a vessel in Gibraltar, an Iranian vessel, the detention of the British flag vessel uh, by the Iranians in the Gulf, uh, they're not equivalent. Uh, Britain insists one was legal, uh, the Gibraltarian one, one was illegal, the Iranian one. Uh, they say there's just simply no connection. Now, you wouldn't have to be a genius to believe that if you are looking towards a solution here, uh, one aspect, one element of that solution might be the release of the ship being held in Gibraltar. That appears now to be happening. uh, So I suppose we must hope uh, that uh, over the ensuing uh, days or so, we may see some kind of progress uh, in terms of the British flagged Stena Impero. Jonathan Marcus. Pakistan says three of its soldiers have been killed in an exchange of fire with Indian forces along the line of control which divides the disputed territory of Kashmir. Earlier this month, the Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi scrapped the autonomous status of the Indian-administered part of Kashmir. From Islamabad, Sekunder Kamani reports. Shelling across the de facto border between the countries is fairly common, but the deaths come amidst rising concern about the developing crisis in Kashmir. The Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi has said his reforms will bring development to Indian-administered Kashmir. But his Pakistani counterpart Imran Khan has accused him of being a Hindu supremacist who aims to suppress the region's Muslim population. Pakistan has been calling for the international community to intervene and the United Nations Security Council are due to hold a closed-doors discussion on the tensions. Despite being Africa's largest economy, Nigeria still faces major infrastructure problems. It has some of the lowest levels of access to electricity in the world. In order to tackle these challenges, private individuals and organizations are taking matters into their own hands by building gated communities with their own amenities. Our correspondent, Mayeni Jones, went to visit one of them. I'm watching hundreds of thousands of people seated in a huge auditorium. Large screens and speakers are broadcasting what's happening on a giant stage. But this isn't a concert or political rally. It's a service at the redeemed Christian Church of God, one of the largest and wealthiest Pentecostal churches 
in Nigeria. Created in the 80s by former maths teacher Enoch Kadeboye, it's grown so much that it's now built its own self-sufficient town. Redemption Camp sits on the outskirts of Nigeria's biggest city, Lagos. Pastor Joseph Obayemi is the church's national overseer. We have the facilities that are really available in any part of this country. For instance, we have 24-7 electricity, 24-7 water supplies, and as you can see our roads, when compared with so many roads in Nigeria, those are the things that we enjoy here. For the town's residents, all these amenities make this a more financially viable place to live. Peter Nadeboye and his family built their house in Redemption Camp 20 years ago. You live in Lagos or outside this Redemption City. There is no light. You've got to fend for yourself. You pay for water, you buy water tank, then you literally pay for someone also to empty your beans. You pay for security, which is not guaranteed. So, by and large, the associate expenses are even more than what you pay on the rent. Redemption Camp is not unique. Other groups are building similar projects. But critics say these are short-term solutions to structural problems. Well, I think it's quite unfortunate that um, private individuals have had to take it into their own hands. Olainka Dosekun is an architect at the Lagos firm Studio Contra Mundum. I do think it's an indictment of the government that is failing to harness taxpayer money to provide these services. And I think that in the long term, the short term solution of private individuals filling the gap will be inadequate. This church has taken matters into its own hands for now. Until Africa's largest economy can provide basic amenities for its population, individuals and organizations like this one will be forced to find ways to bridge the gap. By Annie Jones there in Lagos. Later in the podcast. Nearly two years after Hurricane Irma, the home of Linton Thomas is in disarray and he still hasn't got the roof back on when I visit. We visit the Caribbean island of Barbuda, where the powerful storm also unearthed old enmities, especially over land. The streets of the Yemeni port city of Aden were filled on Thursday with tens of thousands of euphoric demonstrators waving their regional flag and demanding independence for the south of the country. A few days ago, separatist fighters stormed the presidential palace and drove the government's forces out of Aden. But the separatists and the government are also allies in the fight against the Houthi rebel movement in Yemen's long-running civil war. So what happens now? I spoke to our Middle East analyst, Alan Johnston. Well, it was certainly a huge demonstration, vast numbers of people pouring into the heart of Aden. And as you said, the flag of South Yemen with its distinctive red star everywhere. South Yemen used to be an independent state and everyone at that rally wants it to be independent again. And they believe that their cause has real momentum now. In the last week or so, South Yemeni separatist forces have seized control of aid and forcing out government troops. Uh, Up to now, these two elements, the southern separatists and the government, which is supported by Saudi Arabia, have fought on the same side in Yemen's terrible civil war. They fought shoulder to shoulder against the Houthi rebels who control the north of the country. But all the upheaval in Aden has revealed the deepest division in that side of the civil war. Now, the Saudi Arabian government and Riyadh must be looking on quite nervously on this, especially given that they have taken one very clear side in this civil war. Everything has gone badly almost from the start for the Saudis in Yemen. Prince Mohammed bin Salman hoped that by backing the Yemeni government, there'd be a swift victory against the Houthi rebels who are aligned with Saudi Arabia's great rival, Iran. Instead, there have been years of grim, grinding military stalemate. Still, the Houthi rebels fire and missiles. Fa- and famine into as well. The, absolutely. There's been, the war has had a, a terrible impact on the Yemeni people again and again. Civilians have been killed in Saudi airstrikes, as you say, the whole country on the verge of famine. 
all this has played very badly for the Saudis internationally and things have just got worse in Aden for them too. Very, very briefly, uh, do you think there's any chance of Yemen breaking up and southern southern province going their own way? That is a real possibility. If there's any hope for Yemen, it surely is at the negotiating table, but uh, no sign of talks kicking off any time soon. Alan Johnston. Britain and the US have expressed concerns about continuing reports of abductions in Zimbabwe this week ahead of Friday's planned opposition protests over the economic crisis. Zimbabwean activists claim that at least six opposition and civil society members have been abducted and tortured by suspected state agents. The government has denied the accusations. Our reporter, Shingai Inyoka, reports from Harare. The images of the severely injured activists are graphic. The Zimbabwe Human Rights NGO Forum says the victims were accused of mobilizing people to demonstrate. The protests are against rising prices and low wages. Western governments have called on Zimbabwe to respect the right to peaceful protests. It's another blemish on President Emerson Mnangagwa's record. He desperately needs international support to revive the economy. Government spokesperson Nick Mangwana has said the abductions are not what the president stands for and that there's a need to investigate and arrest the culprits. The planned protests organized by the Movement for Democratic Change are backed by the trade unions and they're expected to roll out across the country over the next week. The threat of protests has stoked tensions and police are patrolling the city center. They say they found bags of stones and catapults which they believe will be used for violence. The police warned the public against taking part in the protests. Shinge Enyoka there in Harare. Reports in the United States say that the post-mortem examination on the disgraced financier Jeffrey Epstein, who died in an apparent suicide, found that his neck had been broken in several places. Epstein was found dead in his cell at a prison in New York on Saturday. He'd been awaiting trial on sex trafficking charges. From New York, here's our correspondent Chris Buckler. The flurry of stories about Jeffrey Epstein's death have painted a picture of a prison where the rules were ignored. There have been claims guards did not carry out checks, subsequently falsified reports, and that one of them didn't normally work as a correctional guard. And that's before you consider the question of why Epstein was apparently taken off suicide watch just days after an earlier attempt to kill himself. All of those details have helped fuel conspiracy theories about a man accused of child sex trafficking charges with connections to the very influential. That's why there has been such a focus on the results of the post-mortem examination. They still haven't been officially published, but the Washington Post and other US media reports say that the New York Examiner's Office found that the bones in Jeffrey Epstein's neck had been broken in several places, including the hyoid bone, which is close to the Adam's apple. The Post says a break there is more common in cases where people have been strangled than in hangings, although it can happen in suicides involving older men, and Epstein was 66 years old. Chris Buckler. What is the best way for small nations to rebuild after disaster strikes? In September 2017, Hurricane Irma smashed its way across Barbuda with a population of some 1,800 people. 95% of this small Caribbean island's infrastructure was damaged by the storm, with some houses and businesses completely obliterated. With the government of the twin island state of Antigua and Barbuda and donations from abroad, rebuilding began. But the powerful storm unearthed old enmities, especially over land. Reconstruction is still very much work in progress, as Linda Presley found out when she visited Barbuda. Nearly two years after Hurricane Irma, the home of Linton Thomas is in disarray and he still hasn't got the roof back on when I visit. And how long do you think it's going to take? Maybe in the next week or two. You know, I'll but have... you've got a big job inside your house. Yeah, well, that, that can be done as long as the roof is on. Evidence of Irma is everywhere in Barbuda, in the flapping tarpaulins still covering roofs like Linton's, in the fishing boats marooned in land, shoved there violently by the power of the storm. Everybody says restoration has been too slow. And the national government of Antigua and Barbuda, this is a twin island state, claims it was the system of communal land that hindered recovery. Barbudans never owned land, they leased it. So the government argues when they needed cash to rebuild after the hurricane, they couldn't borrow against their properties. Oh, so this was your bar? And it's got no roof now? (laughs) 
I tell you sometimes, if this was a man-made stuff, I probably would have to kill somebody. But the Almighty work, I just accept it. Since Irma, Hasketh Daniels run his bar out of what was once the storeroom. Like so many Barbudans, his property wasn't insured. Last year, Hasketh was right behind the government when it swept away legislation that guaranteed the island's communal land rights. No, we have we have rights to occupy it, but we have nothing to prove that we're owners. Well, what you think the banks might have lent you money if you had a deed? Right, definitely. But because of that, we wasn't able to to help ourselves. So we depend on the the donors and the government to to help us out to rebuild. Ownership is power. But not for all Barbudans. So this is our little beach shack. This is the beach that the guests have access to. Wow. Yep. Asha Frank paid nothing for the piece of land where she runs a tourist glamping operation on Barbuda's Atlantic coast. The main challenge was to find fresh water. We spoke to a, a gentleman called Parador, who's a farmer, and he uses this side of the island a lot for his farm. And he was literally like, yeah, Asha, right, yeah, this is a bee spot. And we found water. Now, Let's the see. reason why you have been able to become a small businesswoman yeah. is because of Barbuda's very unique relationship with the land, right? Yep, exactly. Land is just not sold in Barbuda. That's part of our history. It's 300 years of living this way, and I think some respect should be given to that history. The absence of private property on Barbuda is one of the reasons why this piece of paradise has remained so undeveloped, especially in comparison to its sister island of Antigua. But high-end tourism is the engine that powers the economies of the Caribbean. And post Irma, the government's declared its intention to boost the industry. And although Barbudans are resisting the move to privatise property in the courts, the minister responsible for the island, Dean Jonas, says it will go ahead. The government is in the process right now of setting up a land registry for Barbuda. We have a land registry in Antigua. So now we have to set up a land registry for Barbuda to survey all the lands in Barbuda, get them registered properly in the court. So the process has started. So, so the surveyors will be going over and surveying people's land and, and the, marking it all up and everything? All the land in Barbuda belongs to the government. OK, it's important that you understand that. Under a new system, Barbudans will be given freehold ownership of the land they occupy. But those who oppose the move wonder what the government has planned for the thousands of acres where no one lives or farms. This could get bloody. As Linton Thomas surveys the wreck of his home, he's ready for a fight. What they are after is this land, and we have no intention of surrendering it to the Antigua government. No. But the government argues that it could bring economic development here if Let it was privatised. Let us do it ourselves. But people need jobs as well, though, Linton, don't we they? We can do it. We can provide jobs. Just leave us alone and let us handle our affairs. A report by Linda Presley on the Caribbean island of Barbuda. The postal address for Trump Tower in New York is 725 Fifth Avenue. But that might be changing soon to 725 President Barack H. Obama Avenue. No, it's not April the 1st. A petition to have that part of Fifth Avenue renamed has been signed by 300,000 people. It already has enough signatures for the Democrat mayor of New York, Bill de Blasio, to consider taking action. Farhana Dawood has been following the story. Elizabeth Rowan, who came up with the idea and launched the, launched the petition on moveon.org, said originally it did start as a joke. She thought it was one of the best ways to anger President Trump to rename the street in front of his signature property after his predecessor. But it did start out on a joke, but it certainly isn't anymore. The petition, as you mentioned, has gained hundreds of thousands of signatories. And Elizabeth Rowan has explained that she wants uh, Manhattan to copy California. California renamed part of the Freeway 134 after President Obama. And she thinks it's legitimate to rename Fifth Avenue because President Obama had many, many accomplishments, including removing Osama bin Laden, the mastermind behind the September 11th terrorist acts that killed over 3,000 New Yorkers. Farhana Dawood. 
And that's all from us for now, but there will be an updated version of the Global News Podcast later. If you want to comment on this edition or the topics covered in it, you can send us an email. The address is globalpodcast, all one word, at bbc.co.uk. I'm Joe Lynham. Until next time, goodbye. Music life. It's just talk about our journeys and how we've got here and what music is to us. Music life. A crowd singing back to you. Yeah. That to me is the most satisfying thing. Music life. My favourite thing about music is we can all listen to it and have a completely different experience. Music life. You have to say, okay, right, I do mean this. Music life. What's going on in this room right yeah. now? A brand new podcast from the BBC World Service. I want to talk about how this is ruining your life. Bringing together <laughs> musicians from across the globe. I love this. Yeah, this is yeah. brilliant. Like, <laughs> talking to each other about how they make their music. When you're just having a good time, you're the most free. There's less pressure mm. to be like, all right, let me think of something that's going to yeah. blow everybody's mind. Exactly. And why? They do what they do. Everyone knows this track and is vibing to it. And that was just a special feeling. Music life. I guess this is just my destiny. (laughs) Find the first three episodes now by searching for Music Life wherever you get your podcasts.